Perhaps you could tell us, Jessica, a little bit about your new book, Finding Charity's Folk, Enslaved and Free Black Women in Maryland. Tell us what it's about. Finding Charity's Folk mm -hmm. is about the process of enslaved women negotiating for their own freedom in revolutionary Maryland. One of the things that happens after the American Revolution in states like Maryland and Virginia is that there is an impulse for slaveholders to, to free their slaves. At the same time that slaves themselves or the enslaved themselves are using the language of the American Revolution f to pursue their own freedom, either via petitions, some of them ran away with the British Army, um, mm -hmm. just a range of things that happened on farm to farm from plantation to plantation. So the book itself looks at the ways in which um, enslaved women artic articulate their own claims to freedom. So that's in, in terms of the meaty, the scholarly aspect mm -hmm. of the study, but the book is also um, bookend on either end with my own story mm -hmm. Um, uncovering the life of a woman in Annapolis by the name of Charity Folks. Yes, yes. And in some ways, she, like many a good historical subject, she took over the project. Mm -hmm. She was supposed to be in a chapter, she became a, se a bigger section of the book, and now the book in some ways is, is bookended by her life. Yeah, it's a truly amazing story about her. Can you maybe give it an encapsulation of that? So Charity Folks was a well-known woman in Annapolis, Maryland. Mm -hmm. And when I say well-known, I, I mean that she was enslaved in the house by, in, in a house by some of the most prominent people in Annapolis. Many scholars have written about either her husband or the people who owned her. But Charity Folks herself, in some ways, has mm -hmm. been hiding right, right in plain sight. Mm -hmm. So I met her acquaintance when I was doing dissertation research, and I happened to come across a manumission document which included her freedom for herself, her children, and her grandchildren. And like most historians, I was thinking in a way, thinking beyond the text. No. What is happening behind the scenes? What did this woman have to do in order to make sure that three generations of her family is freed? So I started trying to find charity mm -hmm. folks, and it was a little bit more difficult than I, than I would have anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, the project stalled for a considerable number of years. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't until I really thought creatively as a historian, we like to sit in the archive, but I thought creatively of a, as a historian, and I pulled back and I asked people around Annapolis what they knew about this woman. Mm -hmm. And it turns out she had an entire life outside of the archive, mm. which is not unlike many African-American women. So what do you mean a life outside the archive? And so mm -hmm. she was well known, mm -hmm. local historians knew about her. Mm -hmm. She might not appear in written documents as many enslaved women did right. not. But if you take a tour around Annapolis, you'll see um, the grounds where she was enslaved. Mm. You'll see the site where she used to live. It's now a Bank of America building. <laughs> but it's on a prominent piece of property right in Annapolis. Mm. The um, Maryland's African American History Museum is on the site of property that she once, own, once owned. So not only was she enslaved, but she worked herself to freedom. And then she prospered after that. Yeah. And the archive doesn't necessarily tell us this. But I was fortunate to speak with local historians who introduced me um, to the descendants of the people who owned her. On my own, I actually tracked down, tracked down some of her descendants. Mm -hmm. We met one day in Annapolis. It was wonderful. We took them on a tour, um, and, and it was wonderful. And it was that moment where history came to life. So the question I'd like to ask about that is, like, uh, how is writing about this story and you know, a story about a certain kind of um, agency mm -hmm. in, under conditions of slavery. How does that help better understand the present that we're in today, which is certainly not free of racial issues? Right. So scholar Sadia Hartman call, says that we're in this afterlife of slavery, yeah. where we're supposed to have this freedom moment, mm -hmm. right? And I think in some ways, some people would argue that freedom, freedom is still an experiment, even mm -hmm. for the U.S. Mm -hmm. but in terms of the increased violence, in term, uh, yeah. violence particularly against African Americans, mm -hmm. police violence against African Americans, um, and police violence again against children mm -hmm. in some mm -hmm. cases. What slavery does do for our understanding of present day violence against African Americans, it gives us a template about uh, the strength of the African American mm -hmm. character, mm -hmm. about the human capacity to survive, mm -hmm. 
um, over I, multiple generations. Uh, over multiple yeah. generations. I think it also says something endemically about not just patients, but the ways in which people have to interrogate kind of the violence that's surrounding them. Mm -hmm. Do Some people might choose just to survive. Mm -hmm. Some people tell their children don't provoke po the police officers. Many people tell their mm -hmm. children not to provoke police officers, just like enslaved people might have told their children yeah. not to provoke. Yeah. But then you always have that person that that doesn't work for them, and so they're going to stand up to the system. You are, by definition, a provocation. Absolutely. So this longer freedom struggle right. has a lot of personalities, right. and I think that's what we can learn from the enslaved experience. There wasn't one experience of slavery, and there's not one experience of freedom. And I also think that we can learn a lot from the enslaved just in terms of how to treat one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On a very basic human level, people are people. They're not brutes as they're portrayed in the media. So I think you can learn a lot from enslaved people. So what would you like people to take away from the work then? On the first basic level, I would like people to take away um, this notion that enslaved women were very active in securing their own freedom. Mm -hmm. And I would be very pleased if the name Charity Folks kind of rang out and, and people identified with her. Charity Folks in some ways is more indicative of slavery in Maryland. Yes. Slavery and freedom coexisted mm -hmm. in the state of Maryland, mm -hmm. particularly in leading up to the Civil War. Because and it was a border state. Because it was a border state. And many of the thing, many of the, much of the focus on enslaved people in Maryland is Frederick Douglass, mm -hmm. who ran away, sure. Harriet Tubman, who was actually freed and, and then exactly. left and came back to help people to freedom. Mm -hmm. But Charity Folks is this individual that was both enslaved and manumitted and that right. she lived her life in Maryland. Right. She's more representative, I would say, mm -hmm. of this enslaved experience in Maryland. So I would like her name to kind of be elevated up there, too, as one of these founding mothers of, you can call it the black freedom struggle, slavery stu studies. But I think that her story in general is such an interesting story that more people need to get to know her. So once again, I'd like to thank Professor Jessica Millward. Uh, and I look forward to you tuning in again for the next Humanities Headlines. This is George Vandenabeel, School of Humanities, UC Irvine. Thank you.